This is one of the most hated buildings in the world. Cold, gray, strange. But what if it was never meant to be pretty? What if it was part of something bigger, a radical experiment we now call brutalist housing? I've traveled across Britain and Europe to analyze these controversial towers, and what I found will change how you see these concrete giants forever. This is Trellick Tower in London. From the street, it looks like a concrete prison. But here's the hidden genius. It was designed by Erno Goldfinger, the man whose name inspired the James Bond villain. Ian Fleming hated the architect so much, he turned his name into cinema's most famous gold-obsessed megalomaniac. Goldfinger solved a problem that had stumped architects for decades. Look at this building's profile. See that separate tower connected by bridges? That's not decoration. That's pure engineering genius. All the elevators, stairs, and utilities are in that detached tower. This means every single apartment gets uninterrupted views and natural light from three sides. This design trick lets 217 families live in a space that would normally fit 80, but each family gets more light, more air, and better views than most luxury housing today. Let me show you how this changes everything about urban design, and it's just the beginning of brutalism's hidden genius. After World War II, architects faced an impossible equation. London needed to house 25% more people on 50% less land. Traditional building methods would take 50 years, so they turned to the second most consumed material on Earth after water, concrete. But not just any concrete. Concrete was seen as the material that would change the world. Utterly optimistic, arguably too optimistic. It could create massive spaces unlike any other material and could be shaped into forms that defied traditional construction. This is the Barbican Estate. When architects Chamberlain, Powell, and Bond designed it, they weren't just building housing, they were redesigning how cities work. Look at the levels. The cars drive underneath on the lowest level. Pedestrians walk on the middle level, completely separated from traffic. Apartments sit on the highest levels with private gardens. It's like three different cities stacked on top of each other. But here's the structural genius. Those massive concrete beams you see aren't just holding up the building. They're creating public space underneath. The Barbican has a concert hall, art gallery, theater, and lake, all carved out of the space created by the building's structure. When it opened, it was the largest residential complex in Europe, housing 2,000 people. But it wasn't built for the poor. It was built for middle-class professionals, doctors, lawyers, teachers. The original idea was to prove that concrete could house anyone, even the wealthy. But even this wasn't enough. The next project would attempt something even crazier. The real design breakthrough came in Sheffield. This is Park Hill, and it solves the biggest problem in high-rise housing. How do you recreate street life in the sky? Most towers use narrow corridors that feel like hotel hallways. Park Hill's corridors are 12 feet wide, wide enough for children to play, neighbors to chat, even milk floats to deliver door to door. They're not corridors, they're aerial streets. The architects called it streets in the sky, but the genius is in the building's zigzag shape across the hillside. That's not aesthetic, it's acoustic engineering. The bends in the structure prevent noise from traveling down the corridors. Sound waves hit the angles and disperse, so residents can have conversations without disturbing neighbors hundreds of feet away. But the most sophisticated design is hidden inside the concrete itself. This is where the real genius lives, and where the term brutalist becomes important. The name doesn't come from brutality, despite what most people think. It comes from Beton Brut, French for raw concrete. The material's honesty was part of its philosophy. Concrete isn't just mixed and poured. Each building required custom formulations. British concrete is chunky and rough, mixed with local aggregates. Japanese concrete is smooth and precise, reflecting their attention to detail. Each country's concrete has its own fingerprint. Look closely at this, the National Theatre in London. See those horizontal ridges? Each one is precisely angled to shed rainwater away from windows and entrances. The building's surface is actually a giant drainage system disguised as sculpture, but it gets deeper. The concrete also contains steel reinforcement bars positioned with mathematical precision. In brutalist buildings, the steel creates three-dimensional networks that distribute loads in multiple directions, letting architects create impossible cantilevers and overhangs. Trellick Tower's cantilevered sections extend 30 feet with no visible support. That's only possible because the rebar inside forms a complex truss system, turning the entire building into a giant structural beam. To work with concrete like this requires immense skill. Architecture students call it the ultimate test, proof that you're really an architect. Once you pour it, there's no going back. Every detail must be planned in advance. 
Here's where Brutalist housing gets truly ingenious. Mass customization. Each apartment slots in like a Lego block, but every block can be different sizes. This approach existed decades before anyone even coined the term. Park Hill has over 900 apartments, but no two floor plans are identical. The balconies show this best. Each family could choose how to enclose their space, glass, concrete panels, or leave it open. The structure provided the frame. Residents provided the personality. This wasn't mass housing. It was what architects call organized complexity. But these architects weren't satisfied with just solving individual apartments. The structural innovations went beyond individual buildings. Brutalist estates used cluster planning, buildings positioned to create cascading public spaces. The Golden Lane Estate in London shows this perfectly. Buildings wrap around courtyards at different heights, creating terraced gardens that step down the site. Upper apartments overlook lower rooftops that become private gardens for the units below. It's vertical suburbia. Every family gets outdoor space and privacy, but at urban density. But perhaps the most radical innovation is defensible space design. Each family controls layers of territory, your apartment, your balcony, your corridor section. You choose your privacy level moment by moment revolutionary thinking about how architecture shapes behavior. For decades, this seemed like the future of housing, but then the political winds shifted and the system that supported these innovations collapsed. Everything changed in the 1980s. The government decided council housing was too expensive and sold 1.5 million homes to private owners under right to buy. The best properties sold first. What remained were the towers nobody wanted. Suddenly, these estates became homes only for the poorest families. And then something sinister happened. Politicians discovered they could win votes by promising to tear down ugly buildings. This is called active neglect. When officials want a building to disappear, they just stop fixing it. Elevators break, windows crack, paint peels. The worse it looks, the more people hate it. But here's the crazy part. When Boston officials tried to tear down their concrete city hall, they discovered they would need nuclear-grade explosives to destroy it. That's how solid these buildings are. The buildings designed to last centuries became symbols of abandonment within decades. But some survived, and today, they tell a different story. This is Trellick Tower again. In the 1980s, newspapers called it a Tower of Terror. Today, a two-bedroom flat here costs 800,000 pounds. The same people who once called it ugly now call it iconic, brutalist architecture. What changed? Instagram happened. These buildings photograph beautifully. The strong shadows, geometric forms, monolithic textures. They're perfect for social media. Fashion photographers discovered them. Photography allowed a new audience to appreciate these buildings for their sculptural qualities. As one architecture critic put it, concrete looks good in photographs. It provides a wonderful setting for people's skin tones, color of their clothes. The buildings that were once backdrops for misery became backdrops for aspiration. But beyond their photogenic qualities lies something even more relevant today. The environmental genius becomes clear when you understand these buildings as climate systems. Those massive walls aren't just structural, they're thermal batteries. The concrete absorbs heat during mild summers and releases it slowly at night keeping apartments comfortable without air conditioning. The window systems show similar sophistication. Ribbon windows, continuous bands of glass, create cross ventilation that pulls fresh air through apartments automatically. The buildings essentially breathe with the seasons. But here's what matters today. Concrete buildings were designed with 30-year energy payback periods. The glass towers replacing them have 80-year payback periods and require continuous air conditioning. Professor Adrian Forty, who studied concrete for decades, puts it this way. As soon as you tear them down, you have to replace them with something else and use up a whole lot more energy, creating a lot more CO2. We're destroying buildings that were already environmentally optimized. This feels familiar. Just like Victorian buildings in the 1960s, once hated, now treasured. Brutalist architecture now finds itself at the same inflection point. Too outdated to be modern, too young to be classic. But some cities are learning from history. Park Hill in Sheffield was renovated instead of demolished. The same concrete structure that was once threatened is now award-winning housing. The architects didn't hide the concrete, they celebrated it, adding colors and textures that work with the material. The streets in the sky that seemed dystopian now feel innovative. Young professionals compete to live there. These design innovations solve problems we're still struggling with today. London needs 66,000 new homes annually. We're building 25,000. But modern construction focuses on maximizing profit, 
not optimizing design. The concrete buildings were demolishing, created larger living spaces using sophisticated structural systems. Contemporary apartments pack small units into simplified structures. We've actually moved backwards in spatial efficiency. But here's what's most remarkable. These innovations happened 60 years ago using slide rules and hand calculations. No computer modeling, no energy simulation software, just architects who understood materials, climate, and human behavior at an intuitive level. They solved problems with intelligence rather than technology, using simple materials in sophisticated ways. Modern architecture tends to solve problems with smart building systems and complex mechanical equipment. Brutalist architecture made the building itself intelligent. These concrete towers are still standing, some loved, some hated, all demonstrating design principles we've forgotten. Next time you see one, don't look at the surface, look at the system. See how the structure creates space. Notice how the building responds to sun and wind. Watch how people move through the designed environments. The genius isn't in making these buildings beautiful. The genius is in making them work. Work for families who need affordable space. Work for cities that need sustainable density. Work for communities that need both privacy and connection. The architects who built these weren't trying to create monuments. They were trying to solve problems that matter. Housing density without losing community, climate control without energy waste, structural innovation without computer modeling. Problems we still need to solve. Maybe it's time to study their solutions, because sometimes the most important innovations don't look pretty, they just work. And in a world facing climate change, housing crises, and urban growth, maybe working is more important than looking good. The concrete may be cold, but the ideas inside are still burning bright. If concrete doesn't look the same to you anymore, hit that like button. And if you want to see more stories about the hidden genius in buildings everyone loves to hate, subscribe and ring the notification bell. Thanks for watching.